Welcome to the Meet the CEO show on Core Finance. My name is Simon French and I'm the Chief Economist and Stockbroker Pamuel Gordon. I'm also joined by David Buick, Pamuel Gordon's market commentator. Today on the show, we're both delighted to welcome Dame Louise Makin, the CEO of £2.6 billion medtech firm BTG. They're listed on the FTSE 250 with the ticker BTG.L. Welcome, Louise, and thank you for joining us today. Louise has been Group CEO since September 2004, and prior to that served at Baxter Healthcare and English China Clay. These roles followed on from a successful academic career, with Louise receiving a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Louise was also appointed a Dame of the British Empire in the 2014 Birthday Honours. BTG is now valued at £2.6 billion and is focused on interventional medicine therapies for liver and other cancers, emphysema and vascular disorders, and speciality pharmaceuticals for acute care uses. It also earns revenues from a legacy licensing business. Under Louise's leadership, the company has seen its market capitalisation increase by a staggering 17-fold. Total returns are greater than 600% and the shares are up 13% over just the last 12 months. Louise, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, BTG's results show good progress in the shift of BTG becoming a medical technology company. Interventional medicine now makes up 38% of total revenue, growing 15% organically. How are you managing this transition from one type of business to another? Well, this transition is really the latest in a series of transitions. Um, when I came in in 2004, we were a broad-based IP licensing business. We worked in such things as software, semiconductors, as well as sort of life sciences. And it was in 2008 that we decided to become a sales and marketing company, making our own products and taking them to physicians direct. So the first transition we made was into a, and we built the specialty pharmaceuticals business. Mm -hmm. And then it was in 2011 when we decided to add to that with our fast-growing interventional medicine business. So since 2011, we've done a further five acquisitions, all in interventional medicine, and built the company. So we now have sales teams in all of the three continents. So transition's a way of life at BTG. We're still very much building the company. And um, we've been able to start from those beginnings of the, of the royalties add the specialty pharmaceuticals business, and now add on a broad portfolio of interventional medicine therapies. Mm. And you talk about two transitions, and that's certainly the view I got speaking to the healthcare analysts at Pamir. And I mean, is that, is that the, the end state? Where do you see the, the business evolving once you, you manage number two transition? Is there a third one in the pipeline? Well, certainly with the specialty pharmaceuticals business and the interventional medicine business, we've got lots of scope to grow those. So the, the next part of the journey is growing those portfolios. A lot of our, our um, products themselves are high growth products in underpenetrated markets, so they're fast growing. But we're also looking to use the, the cash that we generate to invest further into new products and, and new areas. Right. I just want to dig into some of the numbers because they're, they're quite impressive, as I said, in the intro and profit before tax is expected to double from 98 million pounds to 185 million over the next three years on sales of just short of 700 million pounds and what I was interested in is whether this is part of a concerted profit margin strategy from the board or whether it's just indicative of where BTG is in its evolution. Yeah, I think it's um, always, of course, you're looking at your profit margin, but it comes from executing on our strategy. So the number I always like is before we joined with our first acquisition in 2008, there were 57 people in BTG and we're now 1,500. So you're going to, to build a company, your SG&A, your, your R&D, all of those expense lines have to grow. Um, but you get to a point where you have a company, mm. where you have built it. Um, and that's very much where we are today. So we will continue to invest in R&D, we'll be continuing to invest in new things, but the essence of the company is there, so then incremental margin drops down to, to the operating margin. And, and that's essentially where we are in our transition. Mm. And, and that income story, I mean, uh, there isn't a dividend payable at the moment on BTG shares. Clearly, you're still seeing growth, both organic and acquisitive growth as part of what you're trying to do. But will the approach to shareholder returns continue to be like that? Or as the company evolves, does it, does it think the dividends is part of the story in terms of shareholder return? 
I mean, dividends are something that every board thinks about, and, and ours is no exception. But if we look where we are right now, we're in some fast-growing areas, we've got some leading technologies, and we think we've got some really good ways that we can invest the cash we generate and generate higher returns. So at the moment, we're in that investing it to grow the company and deliver shareholder value that way. But it is something that the, the board will keep in, under review as we move into the future. And changing gear slightly into, uh, I'd love to hear about more of the products and the, uh, the sort of the way you're developing med tech. Um, interventional medicine is expected to make up about two thirds of BTG's revenues in five years time. Is that shift because that is where you see the growth in the market? Is it the legacy of the kind of acquisitions you've made? Why the? Because currently there's almost a third, third, third split in the yeah. revenues. And you're moving towards two thirds. Yeah. You just talk investors who may not be yet into the story, interested in the story. Why that transition is taking place? Yeah. Um, so interventional medicine is the fastest growth segment of the business. So by definition, as it grows faster, it becomes more and more. But it's also a very, very um, interesting and fertile place to be. I mean, if you step back and you look at the trends in healthcare, then the good news if you supply healthcare is that people are always going to need it. Yeah. Um, and as an aging population, you're going to get more and more demands on that. But the bad news is that if you're not careful, that's just an ever an escalating bill. Um, what we do in interventional medicine is we provide the opportunity to replace major surgery by minimally invasive procedures, it's called. So you don't no longer cut people open mm. and try to get to something. You actually image the body, oh, the, or physicians image the body, <laughs> they image the body, um, and then they go up through the arterial system with a, a bendy bit of wire, and at the end of that, they have something that will do what you would have opened the body up to find, and that's interventional medicine. So you can replace an operation and maybe three to four weeks of recovery by a 40-minute procedure that's not even done under general anaesthetic where the patient can go home. So you're taking real cost out of the system yeah. by using technology. So that's what interventional medicine is. We do that with liver tumours, we do it with severe blood clots, we do it with severe emphysema, these big diseases that could be very, very costly to treat. And there's more because imaging is increasing um, and so more and more things can be done like that. Pres presumably a big part of the, the, the sales pitch of, of that is the reduced amount of inpatient time that healthcare so the providers around the world are going to have to pay out for. And as you say, the, the demographics are against them in that regard, but in your favour in terms of pro providing a solution. Is that a fair representation? That's absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, if you can work to take fundamental cost out of a system, mm. then you create value. Absolutely. And that value can be shared. It can and be shared for the hospitals of, yeah. and it can be shared for our shareholders. Yeah, and talking of value, before I hand over to David, just one last question. And there'll be a lot of people watching this who may not yet be bought into the BTG story, have missed out on some of the spectacular returns of, uh, since you, you took over. What's the next trigger, really, in terms of the announcement cycle, the development cycle, that you think will... Um, enable BTG to, to move on both in terms of its share price but also in terms of its development as a company. What are you most looking forward to? Uh, well, we've got an interesting 12 to 18 months and a, and a good interesting 12 to 18 months coming up. So as well as the strong growth that we expect from some of our businesses, so interventional oncology, we guide to mid-teens growth, our blood clot treatment, we guide to over 20%. We've also got a couple of early stage businesses that haven't quite got into that sort of linear growth phase and in the next 12 months one of them for venous disease should get a reimbursement code in the, in the US which makes it easier for the payers to pay for it that should be a, a big enabler of that to sort of move into that growth phase um, and then our, our business for severe emphysema it's a European business at the moment but we have a, um, a file in with the U US FDA and if that gets approved maybe in the next 12 months or so, that could open up the fast US market for that, for those products. So a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. David? Dame Louise, I'm not a prophet of doom, but I'm going to have to spoil the party a little bit by ask, asking some very tiresome political questions. And the first one, obviously, is Brexit. And the problem that could come as a result of the UK pulling out of Eurotom, and also the relocation of the European Medicines Agency, What's your assessment of how the UK's decision to leave the EU? Will it affect BTG? 
and the UK, UK health sector. Yes, yeah, so if we look at BTG today, then 90% of our revenues are dollar denominated. So we've been a net beneficiary of Week believe? Sterling. About 55% of our costs are, so we're, we're getting that effect. Um, as we look into the future and the things that sort of affect BTG going forward, then we're interested in access to talent. Now, we're global, so we can place people all over the world, but we have um, operations here, so we would want to make sure that we could get, if we needed the expert in something, we'd like to be able to think that, that, that we could attract them. Um, we're interested in uh, the regulatory side of things. We don't want any more complexity in that. Now, hopefully earlier this week, there was a, a positive announcement about a that. Of iron, that a little the chink. So if that iron. stays, then that removes a worry off the table. And then really we want to make sure that there's a good scientific foundation and, and that comes from you know, global co cooperation across the world as well. So um, those are the things that we've got our eye on, but in the, in the immediate term, it's really all about the exchange rate for us. Brilliant, so hope, hopefully happy sailing. And also I think to say that I believe whatever the government comes up with in terms of Brexit, they need to know that science and medicine is so important. Yeah. And I can't see them blocking people coming into this country that are going to add value. Here's hoping anyway. So anyway, moving on to the next thing, we've got to cross the pond now. And ever since I think it was 1992, when Hillary Clinton first put her oar in over healthcare, it's become quite an interesting subject. And there is some talk that in terms of the last presidential election that fears are growing as regards the regulatory crackdown on drug pricing. I mean, this has been here for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the availability for public or insurance-led healthcare is your situation that you appraise the state of the global healthcare market? Is it okay? Will BTG suffer? Will the, will the healthcare business suffer? So if we look at the US specifically, yeah. where I think a lot of the sort of debate is focused, yeah. then if we take drug pricing, then that's not something that affects us. I mean, that, that tends to be for a, a different type of investment thesis where, where you're, you're spending a huge amount of money on clinical trials and, and need maybe got a small patient population. So that's a Pfizer, Glaxo type problem rather than... Yeah, yeah. Um, if you go back to what I said about interventional medicine, Actually, we're focused on the other side of the equation, which is how do we, how do we create value in the healthcare system by, by using technology to reduce unnecessary steps, think, things like care. So um, we're not really affected by the drug pricing debate. And then if you go to the other debate, which is access to healthcare and are people that have just got insurance, are they going to keep it, not keep it, then in a very pragmatic sense, and sometimes I think you just have to be pragmatic in uncertainty, then we didn't see a big bump up in our business when Obamacare came in. So we're sort of looking at it and saying, actually, we're probably a little bit more specialised than that and not just sort of linked to pure volume trends. So whilst, you know, from um, you know, a point of view that, that we wouldn't want it to go back as we don't think it will have an impact on our business particularly because we weren't affected in a positive sense when, when it yep. became, um, when they got the, the access. Good. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The Office of Budget Responsibility has recently cited that healthcare spending and the challenges of longevity are the single biggest risk to UK public finances. What is BTG doing to take advantage of the demographic trends but also the likely constraints to healthcare spending across all the regions. Yeah, I, I think that that goes to the very essence, and it's you know it's quite unusual that you can sit back and look at an industry and say, "I'm going to create a new company. Where should we go?" And that's what we did in 2011. We'd bought, we'd got the royalties, we'd built the spec pharma business, but we said actually we could build another business here. And we stepped right back and said, what are the trends that we can just see going on forever? And of course, that's, you know, I call it squaring the circle. People are going to get old, healthcare costs are going to get, go up. And unless we can use technology or other things to fundamentally change how things are done, then it's going to be ever increasing and nobody's going to get you know, any chance of, of making progress in that. So we highlighted interventional medicine and focused on it deliberately to put ourselves in line with what we thought was going to be one of the biggest trends Excellent. and most sustainable trends. And, and that plays out in every region of the world. I'm hearing the most lovely tune in my ear. 
that you are onwards and upwards, and I think that's absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to ask you a cheeky question, which I hope you'll forgive me for, is that because you've been on the acquisitive trail and been so successful and delivered shareholder value and with your specialised three divisions, I don't see in any way that you're remotely vulnerable to takeover. And is there any possibility at any time, working on the basis that people say there's always a price, that is not your mode, is it? It's your mode is to, is to press on as BTG. Yeah, we're, we're here to build something. For you. You know, we've, yeah, we've lovely. We've been here a while, we're here to build something. We also know our jobs. We're a yeah. public company and, and our job is to get shareholder value. But we are very excited about the company that we've created, um, the leading positions that we've got. And you know, we have um, supportive shareholders. We're cash generative. We've got the wherewithal to, to take this to a lot of further levels. Excellent. Just a final question for me, if I may. Um, I'm not sure I terribly like this description, but BTG has become a disruptor in the interventional oncology area. How have you targeted your acquisitions and faced up to the challenges of technological progress? I don't um, like the word disruptor. I don't know why. Yeah, um, we would say leader. We, we would say <laughs> Good. leader. Well, I prefer that. <laughs> um, so perhaps to understand interventional oncology, it's, it's sort of good to step back and, and think about, you know, Sadly, most people know somebody that, that's had cancer. And the treatment options tend to be surgery, or they tend to be chemotherapy, or they tend to be radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of variations on, on the order in, in which those, those um, happen. So in the interventional medicine space, so in that sort of minimally invasive, where you, where you don't sort of cut anyone open, or you don't poison the whole body, um, we have leading therapies in chemo, in radiation, and an alternative to surgery, where actually you use ice to grow little ice balls the size and shape of the tumour, and that cuts out the tumour, just as you would do if you were to, um, to go in. We're the only company that has those. We're the only company that has that portfolio of all the alternates, um, and they're market leaders in their space. So we are really well positioned to partner with the interventional oncologist. There's more and more oncology treatments or types of cancer that could be amenable to this sort of interventional play and to work with them to get the data, to, to get the approvals. And, and you know, a really good example of that, um, some people are well aware that there's a, a big revolution, you might say, in oncology, is immuno-oncology agents that, that are sort of looking, and those are the things that the, the big pharma companies are putting, investing huge amounts in. Well, there's a lot of scientific interest in using our type of technology together with those immuno-oncology agents. And the real interest is that at the moment, those immuno-oncology agents very often only work in 30% of patients. Right. But actually, if you pre-treat in the way that with one of our types of treatments, maybe that will go up to 50 or 60. And of course, there's a very limited side effect burden with our type of treatment. So you're keeping that side effect burden low. So even in a changing world like oncology, the fact that these minimally invasive treatments are part and parcel yeah. of what can happen puts us in a really strong position to continue to have that leadership position. So Louise, you've recruited a whole generation of leaders into BTG since you joined in 2004 as the CEO. What have you been looking for? How have you built that management team? Um, very, very thoughtfully. I'm a real believer that the quality of the capability in your people and how they work together is absolutely fundamental. And if you think about how we generate value, we generate value by new technology into the hands of physicians. And so we need people who are really able to work together and work together in the best interest of the patient at, at the end of the day. Um, perhaps a little story, when we sat there after the first acquisition um, on that morning in 2008, we were now 200 people. So we've gone from 57 to 200 people. And we looked ahead and we said, what's the goal? And the goal's FTSE 100. We were worth a lot less than FTSE 100 then. But we knew that was going to be a journey that was going to require us to acquire things, to bring things in, things that we hadn't even thought of. But we said we are never going to turn down an opportunity that will be in our shareholders' interest because we don't have the capability internally. So right from that morning in 2008, we have made sure we've got the right people working together in the right way. And they need to be agile. They need to be highly accountable, they need to be pretty resilient, um, and they need, just need to take great pleasure in doing the right things for 
for those patients that, that we serve every day. Um, and it tends to be self-selecting. Mm -hmm. People thrive at BTG or they don't. Um, and that we've got much better at. Can they grow the into the job? Thrive. Absolutely. So I've they got can. many yeah. people who have had the same job title and they were you know, head of manufacturing when we were 200 people and, yes. and maybe one manufacturing site and now maybe they've got 12 sites and they've grown with it. So there's been a lot of stability in, in the BTG team and we've added, um, but it's a group of very committed leaders who, who are very focused on how we build value. And talking of leaders, your own leadership style, who have been, either who or what, have been the big influencers? I mean, you've been at the head of VTG for 13 years now. Clearly, your leadership style will have evolved over that period. Those key actors, those key influencers, what, what, what were they? Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious, probably, probably to a fault, some people, some people would say. So I find I, I learn from everybody. I learn from sport. Uh, rowing, sailing, co competitive sport. Yeah. Um, I learn from people on the bus. How, how do they work together? You know, I always I've got a network of people that, that I talk to a lot, and so I just learn from everything. That curiosity about how can we do things better. Sometimes does it fit? Is that something that's relevant to, to all the questions that we have? Some sometimes not, and so very hard to pick out one thing mm. um, because it, it's it's everything. Sure. And I just want to pick up on one thing that David said. You talked about uh, leader rather than disruptor in your field. Yeah. Um, and one thing I want to understand is whether you believe the, the patent system, the licensing system, is fit for purpose in the geographies you operate in, and whether you would like to see those evolve, and, and if so, how you think the... you. Know, UK, if it does have some more, and I, I, despite the fact I'm a Remainer, I'm someone who sees the benefits of having a, a more unilateral ability to make the rules. What are the things you'd like to see change that could make your ability as a business to improve people's health outcomes better? Yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of IP, that's been at the core of BTG really since, well, since it was formed. Mm. And so that's something that served us very well, um, both at, not just in our royalties business, but whether it's you know, freedom to operate, which tends to be more the issue on the med tech side or on the pharma side, you know, the, the clear IP situation. I think what we need, whether it's IP, whether it's regulatory pathways, which are probably even more important, mm -hmm. what we need is to make sure that we reduce bureaucracy. Um, clearly you need regulatory pathways, you've got to be making sure things are done in the right way, things are safe before they're used on patients, um, but there are some areas of the world where actually the bureaucracy really gets in the way. So for us it's all about speed to market and it's all about the more we can have pathways that, that take a good idea, mm -hmm. um, get IP around it and then get the data which tends to be the regulatory uh, pathway and the approval and then we can start uh, talking to doctors and patients about it, that's really what we're looking for. Can I just for. chip in? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. no, go for no, it. Be, the FDA, is the United States the toughest place to get regulation? Is it Europe? Is it the UK? Just to give us a little bit of a flavor. It really, um, you're not going to like this because it's a, it, it, <laughs> it depends answer. It really does depend. Everything's a lot easier if you've got good data and that's what we do yep. in BTG. We invest to get the right data. Um, and in fact, in Europe, the approval can often in devices be easier, but then you need to work with the payers in each of the countries. And you can have a, a product that, that's proven to be safe and effective, but the time can be taken working with, with the payers to get adequate reimbursement as well. So each country has its sort of variation on that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, so that's the fundamental is let's make sure that uh, we do the right thing, we get the right uh, the data to, to prove safe effectiveness and um, you know, value for money. And then let's try and get these things into the hands of patients and physicians as quickly as possible. That's what BTG would like to see. Dame Louise, this has been a fascinating 25 minutes for which we are so grateful. And I'm sure many investors who hopefully will have access to this film will be really encouraged with the wonderful job you're doing. Thank you so much from both of us. Thank you. Thank you.